Thank you very much for joining us here on Newsworthy. My name is Anupa Bhusle and our focus on this channel as well as all social media channels really has been to help you navigate this very stressful and anxious time. Of course, there is a plethora of information, but with that, there is a lot of misinformation as well. News, not noise context not conflict that's our motto and we are continuing our series of conversations with doctors and experts and trying to help you navigate the headlines and sort of see the full picture um today we're going to talk about children and covid-19 the impact of the second wave and the possibility of a third wave i'm sure many of you have seen headlines of increased pediatric infrastructure among states how should you navigate this piece of news what is the level of anxiety with which you should operate so i'd also urge you to see a video that we did explaining the third wave uh, and how pandemics do actually go through waves and whether there is a need to be stressed or anxious uh, let me bring in Dr. Neha Joshi. She is a senior consultant in the Department of Pediatrics at the Sita Ram Bharatiya Hospital. Uh, Dr. Joshi, thank you very much uh, for agreeing to speak to us uh, and for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to connect with a lot of uh, parents and uh, care providers, I'm sure, who have the best of intention for their children. Thanks. Um, before Dr. Joshi, we begin the conversation, I thought it would be good for us to put out a disclaimer, oblique, a caveat, uh, that none of this information can be interpreted as specific medical advice uh, meant for a specific individual or a specific case. Would you like to add to that? No, I think I agree with that. And we have to keep in mind that the purpose of this conversation is more about public awareness and empowering parents, educating them more. And it cannot always be customized to their child. And if in case they need a particular advice, they must get in touch with a specific uh, expert like a pediatrician or a doctor. Okay, fair enough. So uh, I think with that contest, let's begin this conversation. Um, Dr. Joshi, I think the first question on everyone's mind is, how did the second wave of COVID-19 impact children specifically and how worried should they be for an impending third wave? Sure. So um, I think what firstly you at the time of introduction, you rightly said that we all need to accept and be aware that pandemics will arrive in waves. There will be opportunities where bugs in the environment will try to find opportunities of transmission to more unknown people who have not had an uh, exposure earlier or may not have had the ability to cope with it, which is something that an inoculation provides. Now, in our experience with the first wave, a lot of pediatricians uh, actually found very few children coming with complaints of any virus-like symptoms. In the second wave, a lot of pediatricians did encounter families who discussed that their children were running fevers or they were having complaints of cough, sore throat, vomitings or diarrhea. What we need to acknowledge is that in the first wave, the overall numbers were lesser. The, th the second wave, when we encountered that, the number of overall cases were much higher. They were around three times higher, which means that denominator had actually expanded. And that was one of the reasons this time a lot of parents spoke about more and more children coming up with these symptoms also. The reassuring aspect in both of these ways, however, has been that a significant majority of children have only demonstrated mild symptoms. More than 90% have had either mild symptoms or may have not even had a symptom. Also, the awareness of testing was much higher this time. So while previously a lot of testing was being focused only on the people who have with symptoms, which were mostly adults, occasional testing was being done in children, which is where asymptomatic children were tested. In the second wave, because there was much more awareness of the possibility that many family members were getting affected, a lot more children also got tested. And that was perhaps also an additional reason that we heard that a lot of children are, you know, experiencing the illness. My point is, 
that for most of them, as pediatricians, what we saw was that they did demonstrate either milder symptoms or hardly a symptom, and they were observed to recover or heal rather promptly. Most of these children were well at home. Not many of them required hospitalizations. Unlike the grown-ups, they did not require CT scans. They did not require serial evaluations and it is a significant majority recovered from the comfort of their homes okay, okay. so uh, so i think there are two sorry to interrupt but i think what you're saying there are two sort of pieces of good news that we need to take from this first that there has been no disproportionate rise in children as far as the second wave is concerned our base increased and therefore perhaps the number of children that came to limelight in terms of cases and the second thing that you're saying is that majority of the children showed sort of mild symptoms or were asymptomatic and got tested because of increase in testing. I'm wondering, Dr. Neha, has there been any difference in the manifestation of this virus in children vis-a-vis -vis adults? So we need to understand uh, two aspects of the entity when it comes to children. Uh, when we talk about an active infection, which is when the virus has invaded our body, we increasingly find that contrary to the, in the first wave, the manifestation was primarily in the adults who were uh, 60 and above and more of those who had comorbidities. In a lot of these people, we did find the presence of severity being high and the requirement for hospitalizations and intensive support. In the second wave, we did observe that the focus had shifted to a younger generation, say between 30 to 45, and some of them did not have these morbidities. Interestingly, in children, despite the shift, we continue to observe that they were predominantly uh, experiencing milder symptoms, which were mostly fever, cough, cold. Some of them did have vomitings. There was some diarrhea. A few of them did have rashes, but a significant majority responded to just home remedies and simple supportive care unlike the adults not very few hardly children required complex medications they did not require antiviral medications they did not require um, they did not present with pneumonia like presentations and they did not require evaluations like ct scan and uh, likewise a very few subset of children we need to identify who might have already been burdened by the presence of some chronic ailments such as asthma or those who might have had a congenital heart disease an entity where right from birth our heart may not have been structurally formed or children who might have experienced burdens on their kidneys these were children with stressed bodies some of these children did present with um, presence of pneumonias and they did require some intensive care and fortunately, with a timely intervention, we did see a lot of healing power in children and signs of recovery as well. Right? So unlike the adults, uh, the degree of severity and the frequency of severity is definitely lesser. But when we discuss the presentation of mild symptoms, they are mostly similar. Mostly similar. I, um, you know, I know this may not be sort of of immediate interest to parents, but I think it would be worthwhile to uh, understand why is this happening? Why is the virus manifesting differently in children's bodies vis-a-vis -vis adults? Sure. So I think one unique advantage that children have manifested in both these waves is that children carry uh, immature bodies which are learning to mature. Now, the edge that they get because of this is that the virus utilizes a certain type of receptor, which is called the ACE2 receptor, to attach to the human body and then invade it and to enter inside. Now, fortunately, children, as their body systems are still evolving and still growing, have not, as of now, manifested these in abundance. They probably will as they're going to grow older. Because of this, because of a lesser expression of these receptors, the virus finds less of an opportunity to find its way inside of them. Secondly, even when the virus does enter their body, in a lot of humans, it is creating a disorganized creation of chemicals which are harming our own bodies. Because of these innocent and naive immune systems, 
they haven't uh, as yet assembled the whole set of chemicals which can actually create this harm so because of these two advantages lesser expression of the receptors and lesser expression of these chemicals fortunately children have not been presenting with either intense or severe episodes I think that's an important point you make and one that several doctors that we've been speaking to have made also differentiating between the first and the second wave first wave you saw adults second wave you saw 30 to 40 years old but there were also people who had sort of maybe a good strong immune response but the immune response was so strong that it ended up harming their bodies and you're saying that doesn't exist in children right so so their ability to uh, because they're so innocent and naive they have they have not yet get have they they haven't discovered the road map to behave this way so we haven't as yet found this impacting the children Uh, Dr. Neha, I know that we've been talking sort of children as a monolith, but this is also an age group. Uh, is there something that we should keep in mind when we are talking about the different age bands as far as children are concerned? Certainly, um, we need to acknowledge that uh, across children, when we discuss age bands, certain uh, children are certain age bands are little more vulnerable, uh, a little more susceptible. and this is by virtue of their body sometimes not being able to give us the symptoms and signs of what might be going on inside so uh, in a very common sensical way over those children who are less than 1 year olds uh, the infant population and the newborn population um, these are these subset of children are believed to be more vulnerable as compared to the other age bands uh this is to do with the fact that they are still developing an immune system and uh because they still don't have the complete capacity in some of these children the virus may actually turn stronger the other uh, age group which we need to be more mindful are the adolescents and particularly the subset of adolescents who may not be physically fit or may be bordering on an obese side so uh in effect these are the two age bands where we need to be more mindful and more careful of the early onset of a symptom however like i said early intervention and an early support and an early monitoring chasing the disease early before it can take the next step has been instrumental in improving the care outcomes across all humans and that holds true for these children as well Okay. So, so I think with sort of this uh, uh, this context, I want to uh, address the next batch of questions, and these are questions that have either come in from parents uh, in response to various other videos that we have done, and they are, uh, I think, to a lot of extent, uh, also consuming a lot of the headlines that are not putting out things in perspective. So I think number one, the source of anxiety is news and headlines about increased. infrastructure related to children related to pediatrics etc that many many states are preparing themselves for uh, how should parents look at this information uh, and consume it right so uh, before i answer this i think we need to understand two entities related to covid in children one is the preparedness for if and when if and when a third wave were to happen and in anticipation of the fact that the bug will try its way to find human body that have not uh, had the opportunity of an inoculation or may have not gotten infected and this does not include exclusively children it will include all sections of the population so one is the level of preparedness to that extent um, the other aspect on the other hand is being prepared for the emergence of a uh, covid related illness that has been increasingly now uh, being acknowledged or identified um in children who have previously had an exposure with either symptomatic or um, an asymptomatic stint with covid hmm. this entity which is called the misc or an multi system inflammatory syndrome in children is hmm. an increasingly being studied clinical behavior which we are increasingly observing in an interval of 2 to 6 weeks uh, past an exposure so this is something we are observing during the recovery time 
this is uh, unlike the covid uh, in acute in viral infection this is an entity which is being seen in children who are not contagious these has been this is being seen in children who have been previously healthy but after had an exposure to covid some of them so i say i repeat some of them not all of these children studies so far or a research so far suggests maybe less than 1% of these children may manifest a set of clinical complaints which will include fever which hmm. may include some breathing concerns which may include nausea vomiting fever a spectrum which may make us worry whether this is a fresh infection of covid hmm. or this is maybe something else that is now being increasingly seen in children and preparation is on its way to address these spectrum of children this is because while uh, these children are non contagious and they are in the recovery phase some of these children need much more close monitoring they may experience uh, moderate to severe spectrums and they may need intensive care so one mm -hmm. there needs to be more awareness at the parental level about the possibility second there needs to be awareness in the medical community about the same mm -hmm. possibility especially for a country like ours where we also have other illnesses like dengue malaria typhoid which in these times may lead us to wonder what is causing the fever in children and there needs to be more preparedness at the infrastructure level to be able to monitor these children perform lab tests on these children intervene provide medications with the help of the nursing manpower and the medical community the doctors particularly so i think uh, extre extremely useful but if i can just push that a little further how should parents or what should parents be aware of in this post covid complication spectrum what is what is uh, what are the signs that they should be aware of so um, for all families who have had an exposure with covid and especially mm -hmm. where children were also present in these families irrespective of whether that child had an episode of frank illness which could lead to the conclusion that he had it which means whether irrespective of whether children were asymptomatic or symptomatic parents need to keep in mind that they need to observe especially for the next 2 to 6 weeks in some children even 8 weeks so effectively 1 and a half to 2 months they need to watch out for the reemergence of fever in children some of the symptoms that are critical is presence of fever nausea vomiting a, a severe belly pain swellings in the muscles in the joints a uh, painful uh, tender body parts so when you touch the child winces in pain presence of a red eye presence of a red fiery tongue presence of some tender nodular swellings if any of the children were to experience one or more of these complaints it is important that they in they stay in touch with the doctor it will be uh, what will be desired is that once the physician or the pediatrician has evaluated the presence of these complaints it is quite likely that they will inquire for a physical examination and may recommend some blood tests also so what parents need to be mindful of is that in case they are observing this it should not be disregarded as a routine seasonal infection or a routine episode which might have affected children in the past and they need to try and understand if at all this could be related and this is necessary because early intervention early detection results very good outcomes in these children okay fair enough um uh, i think there are a whole lot of questions that came to us also relating to immunization of children uh not covid specific obviously but sort of the other routine immunization that should continue would you what would you what would your advice to parents be so absolutely um one of the benefits of one of the very key benefits of immunization is that it keeps them protected from severe degrees of prevailing bug in the environment children are still learning how to prevent these infections and inoculation is a very very strong weapon to in their bodies how to cope with these infections if at all they get exposed now looking at the current circumstances uh, we have to evaluate what we understand is a risk benefit ratio 
now for the cohort of children it is true it is important to protect them from the prevailing pandemic at the same time all of these children deserve and require benefit of protection from the other prevailing diseases as well if in an unfortunate circumstance the child does develop uh, the infection from what we know are already preventable diseases in that case they may become even more vulnerable to uh, a complication if they do contract covid so what we have in hand is an action point that we can actually prevent from these uh, diseases from these known enemies so providing them protection from their pending inoculations is a certain priority it of course has to be weighed against the possibility of ex- risk of exposure to the prevailing pandemic but that is something that increasingly is the need of the hour and we must encourage all parents to recognize that children once they have this uh, weaponry with them that they can protect themselves from the other diseases is one indirect way of also keeping them protected from any other complication that can come with covid um i mean i i think that's such sort of vital information as to how parents should navigate uh, taking their children for immunization um dr neha uh, we know recently that the government amended guidelines uh, related to lactating mothers that they are now in eligible category for the covid-19 vaccine uh what would sort of your recommendation be for lactating mothers number 1 and b if lactating mothers were to contract covid Right. So, um, first and foremost, vaccination is one of the key measures we can use to keep ourselves and our little ones safe. Keep in mind that be the first wave or the second wave, the children were not the first to contract the infection. It were the grown ups around them. So, once they are inoculated and they have a defense in place, we have created a fort around this child, and we have actually tried to uh, stall the entry of the bug to their bodies uh, when therefore when we talk about lactating women now these are women who are taking care of infants we just discussed that infants form a vulnerable population okay. so the dual benefit that lactating women acquire once they have received the inoculation is one by protecting themselves they have indirectly protected their child also when they create uh, protective antibodies or neutralizing antibodies these are passing over to the child through the act of uh, breastfeeding Breastfeed. and this is another benefit that is in sight whenever the uh, breastfeeding is continued for the baby whose mother has just received an inoculation in case of an unfortunate circumstance where the mother were to experience an in a uh, covid infection uh, it is again instrumental to recognize that her body is learning to create antibodies against the bug and these antibodies is what is also going to protect her and it has the capacity to protect her child so we uh, all academic bodies the who the indian academy of pediatrics the american academy of pediatrics all of them strongly recommend passing over this benefit to the child the breastfeeding not only provides the specific antibody it has a host of protective factors which are going to be instrumental in training this child how to keep itself strong against many other bugs as well so if we overall look at the advantage of breastfeeding it is actually huge yes there is a possible risk that if the child stays in the same environment as the mother it might also acquire the infection and therefore to minimize that the guidelines recommend that when the mother does handle her child she can don a mask she can wear a mask she can maintain hand hygiene and uh, the times when she is around the child she can be seated in a well ventilated room so for this baby receiving that milk is in some way a preventive medicine so we have to figure a way of delivering this to the child in the most safest and the efficient way so any anxiety related to breastfeeding and covid uh is something that uh, mothers lactating mothers should remove from their minds right absolutely there is no research to say that breastfeeding will uh, at all transmit any infection and this is something which is true across all infections breastfeeding is actually offering the solution to the infection it is actually empowering the child to receive antibodies to keep itself protected
Hmm. Um, Dr. Neha, I know that there are government guidelines that are not opening up pregnant women uh, for COVID-19 vaccination, at least the two vaccines that are here available in India currently. Why is that the logic that you just explained vis-a-vis -vis breastfeeding and lactating mothers not applicable in this case? So I think what we are increasingly uh, realizing is across the West where uh, more time has passed and more research has happened, uh, it has been recognized that pregnant women are a vulnerable population. And therefore, they do deserve a protective mechanism like the rest of the population. Fortunately, uh, the vaccines which we are utilizing are not exactly uh, live vaccines. They are modified vaccines. And therefore, the degree of effect that they may produce in the body is uh, attenuated it is subdued and it will just remind the body how to produce a response when research has been underway uh, the cdc the center for disease uh, center in uh, usa has already recommended the utility of these vaccines in pregnant women to keep them safe this is probably because they have had the ability to conduct these researches as they are now wiser with the benefit of time a lot of uh, academic bodies, including Foxy, and a lot of bodies who are pertaining, who are discussing the, the team of obstetricians, who are discussing the opportunity of inoculation in pregnant women, are already endorsing the view that women need to be protected and the risk of these vaccines to the pregnant women is actually way lesser than the benefit that they acquire by keeping themselves and the little one inside them safe. Hopefully, as the academic um, voices rise and as more research gets underway for our set of population, we are hoping that uh, like the recommendation or the advisory for the lactating women has changed, perhaps there will be more robust data soon to recommend that next vulnerable section can also be offered this protection. Fair enough. I think uh, that that's a good view for any of our viewers. And remember, we've done a whole lot of work uh, with doctors, with representatives from Foxy about this conundrum and a whole host of petitions are currently in public domain, asking the government to look at this in priority. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Neha, uh, you know, many other countries, I think, uh, like Canada, for instance, perhaps even UK and the US have started vaccinating their children, the children population has started getting vaccinated. Um, and, you know, what happens often is that then there sort of is a buildup of pressure. And um, do you think it's wise for a country like India to sort of mimic what's happening there in the West, primarily also because we have large sections of our demographics that still remain vulnerable, that are still in the vulnerable population. We have not vaccinated all our elderly. We have not vaccinated pregnant women. We have not vaccinated all of our frontline healthcare workers, etc. I think that's a very valid point you raised. Um, and when we want to answer such a concern, we have to realize that we need to address the situation with a more of a rational, logical approach than a lens of anxiety. So a lens of anxiety will say that uh, children have always been more vulnerable, so we must, of course, prioritize them at all costs. But let's again go back to focus on what we have actually seen. Be it the first wave or subsequently the second wave, increasing data, increasing observations have demonstrated that the more vulnerable people have been the adults, be the senior citizens in the first wave or let's say the uh, adult population between 30 to 45. This was the segment of population that manifested more and more spectrum of moderate to severe diseases, which required a lot of intensive support and intensive care. Reassuringly, children on the other hand were increasingly demonstrating mostly mild symptoms and mostly asymptomatic symptoms and for those of who, uh, those children who were demonstrating symptoms were recovering right from in their houses. These were not the children, they, most of them never required hospitalizations or intensive care. So something tells us that right now the need of the hour or the priority is to focus on the more vulnerable children. So at this point in time, keeping those demographics, we have to be wiser about stopping the chain of transmission, stopping the disease severity by particularly focusing on the group which is the most vulnerable. Second aspect is uh, for a lot of these children, the 
we our experience showed that they acquired this from these care providers and so unless and until we have actually created a cocoon for them we have created a fort where these care providers are inoculated the vulnerability of children will already be high so one way of actually working towards reducing the vulnerability is protecting the more mobile population which needs to get back to work which needs to protect these children they, they which need to take care of the other economic financial needs of their families who need to step out once they are protected it works like a proper cocoon for these children because if they don't acquire the bug children don't acquire the bug i think um, i'm going to pick on the line that you uh, said in the answer about anxiety is not the lens to actually tackle this pandemic as a whole but of obviously more specifically related to children i'll wrap up this conversation dr joshi but just sort of um as sort of a ready reckoner um what would you advise parents uh sort of three points that you would advise parents and three points if their children are showing sort of any symptoms that could be covid or non covid what should they be careful careful with sure so i think um one of the most important things we have to recognize is um uh, like the way the virus entered our community it affected one then the other and finally it moved it moved like a collective wildfire every action by an individual when we scale it up at a collective level is going to be instrumental in thwarting this from re-entering our lives again so one of the key measures we have to keep in mind is the selection and the compliance with a covid appropriate behavior mm -hmm. and parents need to role model this for their children why we we do not know whether a third wave will come but what we do know is that using a covid appropriate behavior we can control the transmission we can increase the gap between the time it is going to affect a uh, new individuals who have not had an exposure so parents need to role model this behavior and what we observe is that particularly the children follow the parents who are more than 5 will willingly do and those between 2 and 5 uh, would like to be taught and would like to follow the others around as well so covid appropriate behavior is one key that we need to keep in mind the second is if we are our future prospects we need to be wiser about our inoculations so inoculation is a very necessary armamentarium to create a whole robust uh, opportunity where a lot of people are already they carry an immunity towards acquiring the virus so participating in inoculation drives maintaining a covid appropriate behavior is the key an important point to remember is even if a child were to demonstrate symptoms of covid let us keep in mind that reassuring the our past experience has taught us that children are great healers that with the right amount of support they tend to recover very fast and in our experience they have they have been the ones who have actually led this change so keeping these aspects in mind let us not panic like any other illness when our child does experience any fever cough cold we approach this with a rational worry so let us keep in mind that we need to take the advice of an expert and not self medicate and not self rush to use the whole medicines that the adults have been using because these bodies are different they are not just young um, they are not just copies of adults they are very different bodies and they have immense potential to heal so let us tap that potential lastly let us not create stress and anxiety about this entity because these gentle minds are watching you and they have this whole set of antennas around them and any anxiety around this is something that they imbibe so let's keep it in mind they are looking for strength from us and uh, we need to be therefore more mindful and watchful of our behaviors uh, if we need to keep keep these little ones safe and secure fair enough uh, dr joshi that's so so well summarized i think we'll put out a graphic as well of the four to five things that anyone who's a parent or anyone who's taking care of a child should remember so one lead by example engage in covid appropriate behavior number two at the first opportunity do vaccinate yourself number three if your children do or may show any signs that look like covid take the consultation of a doctor speak to a doctor do not self medicate as dr joshi has pointed out so so very rightly and i think last of it consume 
consume information that's not making you anxious and don't pass on that anxiety to your children. Dr. Joshi, I really appreciate you. Um, thank you so much for sparing this time on what would certainly be a busy day ahead. And uh, we'll perhaps get back to you if there are any additional questions that come in from parents or caregivers. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this talk. Thank you so much. Pleasure.